my great pleasure to welcome Niccolo Forastieri di San Pietro, who is CEO of Northacre. Um, and to set today's conversation in context, just a little about Northacre. You specialize in super prime real estate in central London and have designed over a million square feet and more than 1,000 apartments and houses in the capital in recent years, some achievement. So Nicola, did you always know that you wanted to specialize in super prime real estate? I mean, you've got a background in finance and uh, real estate, but if you start at the beginning, what sort of brought you into this world? No, I didn't. I think like most kids, when you finish university, you really don't know what you're going to do. And having finished university in the early 90s, uh, you know, I was focused on thinking that I only wanted to make money and I wanted to go into finance and I wanted to go and run a hedge fund. So that was my first job. So I was in the hedge fund industry for uh, 12 years um, and then I turned into, into real estate. So halfway through my career, having said that, my parents did think that I was a bit strange when I was a kid and I would walk through Rome and point out all the buildings. <laughs> so I think it was in me originally. You previously worked at Estate 4, um, and I know that Alessandro there was a really a, a great uh, mentor for you, and I wondered what it was about that that, that uh, really inspired you. Um, and that's well, because I think Alessandro Cairat is, is an inspiring guy, first of all. He started from nothing, and he deliver, delivered 3 million square feet uh, of space in, in, in Milan, and Milan is only 1.8 million people, so 3 million square feet in Milan is a lot. And what he did is he got uh, brought back to life old factories, the San Pellegrino bottling factory, Richard Ginori, all those places that were in disuse and created the largest fashion quarter in the world with the headquarters of Armani, Zegna, Todd's, Diesel, all those. So he changed the perception of an area, and, um, and that was hugely inspiring. So this decision to move from the world of hedge funds and finance to super prime real estate, um, do you think that the sort of that, that financial background really has helped you in, 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 in how you've, you've looked at the market and, and so on? Because I think it's quite rare. I'm not aware of, I mean, there are a lot of financial people who've moved in to run property development companies, but not in the way that you have as, um, you know, Yes, there are not many hedge fund managers that become real estate developers, yeah. I agree. I think the rigor for the numbers has helped dramatically. And, uh, and I think, you know, wherever I've been between Estate 4 and Northacre, you know, the focus on numbers has really enabled us to, to do exceptionally well uh, from a financial perspective, which, uh, which has helped. So it served me very well, I have to say. Yeah. So in terms of your um, Italian cultural heritage, do you think that that is something that's really, um, you know, you, you've tried to sort of, uh, has that defined the way you've done things? And well, I have to say, if you, if you look at Northacre now, Northacre had a very strong design DNA from, from the beginning, yeah. right? Way, way before me. So Northacre started in 1989, was the first super prime developer in, in, in central London, and it was started by an architect. So the only actual uh, developer of super high end in London that I can think of that was started by an architect, and hence design is it's in, in its DNA. You know, obviously, having grown up in Rome and uh, amongst a lot of beautiful things, um, I tried to bring some of that as well in what we do and the developments that we do at the moment. Yes. Yeah, and and I mean, you you you, uh, you mentioned that in terms of the, the 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 design, but also the sort of practical concerns that people have because you're creating homes for yeah. people, not not just sort of developments. And and I wonder what are those things now that people are looking at it you know, over the sort of the, the gyms, the, uh, what are the trends that you're seeing in, um, in the market now for, the, for that ultra, sort of that super high? Super now I'm going to go against a lot of our marketing literature in a certain way. Come on, let's go free range. You know, it's, um, we always preach that we do the best facilities that possibly you can have, the biggest pools, the best gyms and so on. However, if you then really go and look at the usage, and we have a lot of data on this, mm -hmm, I'm sure. um, because we've done 12 super prime developments, right? So we've got data going back now all the way to 1996. Amazing. The, the usage is not humongous. So really, you need it because you cannot be left out of the game. But what actually people want is that you actually understand them as a, as a customer and how you, you know, and how you deliver the actual inside of the home if it caters to how they live their lifestyle. And so having done it repeatedly, we understand different nationalities, what they want, what they don't want. We also understand different assets, who it will appeal to and so on. So by matching the two together, we're able to deliver something that actually is, is, you know, is tailor-made 
for whoever will be buying it. Interesting, you mentioned that sort of that data, and I guess that goes back also to your roots in terms Absolutely. of really, um, you know, it is in, invaluable, isn't it, when you, you get to use it. So what are the, the things that, that the, the must-haves that the ultra-high net worth has to have now in their home, and whether it's for you know, bragging rights or that they just can't live without? Developer, developers in general, like you know, are are an insecure bunch. Yeah. So they they tend and we tend to put a lot of stuff in the apartments because the more we put in, um, it's got all the bells and whistles, and they will sell in uh, easier. The fact is that actually, um, people don't want all the electronics in it. They want a nice switch that goes on, off, <laughs> and dim. You know, basic. And also, what they want is, for example, a lot of white walls. Yeah. Because the bragging rights nowadays is not the apartment. Because how much is the apartment worth? Five, ten, fifty million. So and they can have one piece of art. Yes, absolutely. So the bragging rights, in a certain way, comes with what they put in it. And so we have to give them as much as a white canvas as possible to enable to, for their personality to come out, not for our personality to be in there. Mm -hmm. the, the, the current state of the property market and uh, the, the confidence that's coming back. Have you seen? Um, a lot more buyer interest coming back since the result of the general election. We were chatting just before, but you know, the, the, uh, a lot of things had uh, Corbyn clauses in them as well. So yep. have you seen a bounce since December? Look, I think that a lot of the anxiety that people had with, uh, with the possibility of Corbyn coming to power have gone. And hence, I think some of the ultra high end purchases that were in the pipeline have actually gone through. Everyone's read, you know, the 200 million pound home that sold in Knightsbridge. Uh, you know, there's a 40 million pound apartment in, in, in one Hyde Park. And there have been several transactions. But, you know, let's not kid ourselves, that's not the market, right? So I think we've had a bounce in, in the last couple of months. Um, but I'm not sure it's still plain sailing in the, next, in the next couple of years. I think there is some bad news to come out of, of Brexit negotiations going forward, right? Mm -hmm. Only the headline has been done, yeah. right? So the negotiations are going to start uh, next month, and I think that it's not going to be an easy ride. Um, and also we have to keep in mind that you know, we've had a general economic expansion that has lasted 10 years. GDP growth around the world has gone moved forward for 10 years. Um, and, um, you know, so if I was a betting man, I would say that there's going to be a slow in GDP growth in the mm -hmm. next couple of years. And so I'm kind of against the current. People are very <laughs> bullish going forward. I'm still cautious for the next couple of years, even though we've seen more transactions. We've sold, we've sold more units in our two developments in the last three months than, than our last two years combined. Congratulations. Thank you. It's a, it's a it was very slow before. <laughs> But it's a long-term business property, isn't it? Absolutely. So, um, yeah. and, and there's an investment as well. Um, but let's imagine that December had, had gone differently. And I know your focus has really been on central London. But where else in the world excites you that has the... I mean, I know London is the real passion for Northacre and, and, and for you. But, but where else um, do you think has the, uh, that kind of X factor? Okay. Starting from the premise that obviously real estate is very local, right? So you should be... You, you better stick to what you do where you know mm -hmm. how to do it, first of all. So that's our first mantra. Secondly, I think that it's, there are very few places in the world that can take over from, uh, from London as one of the really the main, main cities for high end residential. Having said that, um, one has to see where there are big taxation changes, right? Where the city is in a certain way is still big enough in a certain way for. Um, you know, to have that enough wealth to create these large developments which have Absolutely. GDVs, you know, half a billion pounds to a billion pounds. Um, and now I'm going to talk my own country because actually Milan yeah. is one of those, one of those cities. Mm -hmm. Milan is a city that's changed dramatically in the last five years since the expo. Um, and what they've done is they've changed the taxation system for people that come from the outside. And so Milan is going through an incredible renaissance at the moment. Uh, prices have gone up, I would say, 30 to 40 percent in the last couple of years. Um, and there is no stock around. That's the first point. And there's also no stock around to cater for the people that are used to high-end residential in London. Interesting. Because high-end residential in London is very different to what you would have in Madrid, Barcelona, Milan, and so on. Right? The level of specification is completely different. And the, the, there are this similar opportunities in terms of regeneration of those 
those areas and the well, I mean, industrial the, sites. Um, th there is that, but also, you know, Milan is, is fortunate enough to have some incredible buildings. Yes. And so you're starting with fantastic bones already and buildings that are also large as well. So they would cater very well for the product that we do. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, maybe. I, I know this is, this is not us sort of announcing some new strategy for North Asia. No, 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 no. But I'm just interested in terms of the, uh, that, that, that wider world. It's but on my wish list, let's put it this way. Great. In terms of the, uh, the, the types of locations that uh, your potential buyers favour, I mean, I know that you have one site that uh, the number one Palace Street development has the Queen as its closest neighbour. I mean, our things is you know, privacy, plenty of space, that sort of thing are obviously uh, important, but that must be a very exciting uh, development for you. Absolutely. I mean, one Palace Street is, is quite unique because it's the only... Um, for now, residential development overlooking the gardens of Buckingham Palace because then you're going to have the peninsula apartments that are going to be overlooking it as well, even though we're closer. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I think that that buyers in central London are, are more, are less, sorry, uh, postcode phobic than they were before. Yeah. Um, they are very product driven. So um, they are willing, within reason, to travel to different areas. Uh, still very close to the center if if you're delivering something that is special mm -hmm. at the end mm -hmm. and that's where that corporate reputation is and that's and that's where 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 knowing really your customer and delivering what you what you would like to mm -hmm. see um comes into play as well and with the pedigree that actually you know people that have bought our our apartments in the last 30 years um, there's a super high occupancy rate in them, right? We always talk about London lights out and so on. Yeah. We've got super high occupancy, so owner-occupier. Um, and people love to live in them. When they, when they come up for rent, you know, they get rented out right away. And that speaks volumes and people know that. So they tend, uh, it's slightly easier sell. And in terms of sustainability um, and uh, you know, all those environmental concerns there are, how is that sort of factored into what you're doing and, and uh, what buyers want now? Yeah, I mean, f I mean, f first of all, before what buyers want, you know, um, we are an awful industry, <laughs> right, on the environmental mm -hmm. side. Um, I think that something like 40% of all waste in the UK is generated generated by the construction industry, right? It's an incredible statistic. It's yeah. an incredible statistic, absolutely. So, um, first of all, we only deal with um, with contractors that actually have a very sustainable um, uh, conduit and, and subcontractors uh, regarding you know, wood, concrete, steel, and so on. So um, we try to minimize it that way. Mm -hmm. Buyers still have not come around that they need to pay more for sustainable building, unfortunately. Mm. So it is difficult to change the developer's mindset further than that, right? Uh, in a time where profits are, are have been squeezed dramatically in the last four or five years, I think you're going to see that in the next in the next bull market. Yeah, and I, but I, I think the uh, the Greta um, yeah. impact has been really the, 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 the speed of change. And I know in an industry such as yours, it's it's very difficult because a lot of processes have to change. But it does seem that there is a, a real commitment. I mean, if you now. you know, if in, in general, if you look at the you know the Davos strategic papers and you know Merrill Lynch did a very interesting. Uh, report and they they took all the different um, talks that there were in all the different papers and you know the number one uh, um, you know word that was in there was sustainability yeah so we we, we better get going I saw that um, you're supplying uh, residential buyers of North Acres Broadway development in Westminster uh, with a membership of Zipcar sharing yep. service so, um, I know it sounds a bit of a counterintuitive yeah. selling 10 million pound apartments with the Zipcar service in there but um, the, the problem was that um, sometimes the authorities are a bit behind. So when I went to have a meeting for getting uh, planning for the Broadway, I said, I don't want to build three basements. By the way, each basement is 1.7 acres, right? So you can imagine, <laughs> right? Yes. So I don't want to build three, three basements. I only want to build one uh, to put my facilities and my plant room and everything and uh, because I don't want to have any parking in there because I don't want people to use cars. And they looked at me as if I was an alien. Yes. Right? And so uh, we compromised, and I decided at the same time that I wanted to use some of the spaces for the zip cars. They still thought I was mad, and, but we're putting them in. And actually, the buyers that until now have exchanged love the idea. Fantastic. So, you know. And it's a nice story to tell as well. Yeah, because absolutely. Because it, it leads you beautifully into that commitment to, yeah, absolutely. Uh, to what you're doing. Um, and 
Now, just to, to you, sort of your your personal leadership style, um, and I, I just wonder whether you know. There's, there's a whole sort of team element, but there has to be one person's vision, doesn't there, to, to deliver this. I mean, you're, you're, you're very keen to allow your team to get on with things, but um, just talk to me a little bit about your, your leadership style. And well, I think that at the beginning, when you, when you um, find the site that you want to buy, you've got to have a clear vision of what you want to deliver, uh -huh. and you have to transmit that to the team, right? Um, which, is a, which is the big part of the job. Having said that, then hopefully, and, and my team is, you've got really good people working for you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they're hopefully all much more skilled than I am at what they do. And so they, they you know, with some supervision, they're able to deliver a product that is, that is in line with the vision that, 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 that I had at the beginning. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and that has happened, you know, if you look at Palace Street, if, actually if you look at the Broadway as well, which is, which is interesting because we didn't have already a facade, it's a brand new building completely. Mm -hmm. Um, the team have uh, have been interpreting the, the, the original vision fantastically, and uh, and I'm super proud. Brilliant. And finally, in terms of the issue of legacy to you personally, how important is that? And, and can you really create buildings that um, serve generation after generation when people are always looking that you know that the, the, the fashions and the requirements change so much? So, I mean, what do you do you feel about your sort of personal legacy? Um, First of all, I think that I inherited a legacy at Northacre, right? Mm -hmm. As I said before, Northacre has been around way before me, and uh, they, um, I'm the, how can I say, I'm, I'm the protector of the legacy at the moment. Having said that, we're also doing new developments at the moment, and I think that um, addressing your point, everyone wants the newer, shinier building and wants to move on, <coughs> I think that what you're having at the moment in Prime Central London is the last hurrah of high-end residential large developments. Okay. These now are the last ones, and, and there are several reasons for it. Um, the first of all is the planning has changed dramatically, right? So if you look at, for example, the Westminster plan that came into effect in December and is into effect until 2040, um, there are so many restrictions that they don't enable you to deliver what you want to deliver, right? Mm -hmm. No apartment greater than 1,600 square feet, no amalgamation of units, no building taller than 10 floors, you know, and so on and so on and so on. And then if you add to that actually the affordable housing aspect of it, mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult to create high-end residential if you've got 50% or 30% affordable on site on that site, mm -hmm. right? Um, and lastly, if you look at, I always say that our buildings are wonderfully inefficient in the sense that you are not just buying your four walls, there's so much more to it. Um, that comes to a great cost, right? So, you know, for every more or less square foot that I sell, I've got to build two square feet. And with the cost of construction at the moment, that is not viable anymore. Yeah. So these are really the last ones. And so the legacy is actually quite simple this time. There aren't going to be any ones other similar going forward that don't have already planning now. That's it's a dim. Point. It's a bit of a you know. Yeah, well, I know. Is. And so when everybody talks about you know there's you know there's there's uh, too much supply and so on. Actually, in the super prime area, there isn't and there won't be. Amazing. Well, thank you very much. This has been fascinating. I've been a, a fan of what Northake has been doing. You're for very some kind. Time thank you so much. It's been great talking. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. much. Thank you. <laughs>